Hi, I'm Lynn, and uh, this is Tuning Your Brain, and thank everybody for coming. Um, there's a number of you, so I'm just going to pretend like there's five. It makes it easier. Um, but unfortunately, we're going to end a little bit early today because my demo, I got, ended up getting the wrong part. And even though someone thinks that electrocuting people on stage might be much more exciting, I decided it was maybe a bad plan, so I'm going to skip that. Um, so to go ahead and start, um, just kind of about me and why I'm doing this. I actually have no background in neuroscience whatsoever, um, except that when I was about 18, like a million years ago, um, I was actually a research assistant uh, for the neuroscience grad students at my school. And so I spent a lot of time um, prepping the students or study participants uh, for EEGs to get them prepped. It was actually my original major, and somehow I ended up as an art major. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, but uh, I've been reading about neuroscience on and off for pretty much since then. And um, it's like it has a personal reason for me. I have an anxiety disorder. I have some other issues. Um, and so for me, I need uh, tools so that I can kind of get through my day and get through you know, whatever issues I have. And so these are the tools I've found, and this is kind of what works for me. Um, I actually, much like Neon Rain, can't take most of the medications available out there. So um, I have to find another way. Um, but uh, I've been a web developer for the last eight years, and one of the things I've noticed is that music absolutely makes uh, a huge difference when I'm working. Um, not just any music, <laughs> uh, trance or goa or anything high beat per minute, no lyrics, can't be lyrics. I know some people work in silence, I have no idea how you do it. I, it just doesn't work for me at all. I'll sit there and I'll end up in a like, black hole. <laughs> so, um, I've actually, what I've been doing since I've kind of realized this, um, is I actually use music as a cue. So um, I've set it up so that when I hear certain music, um, that presents, I automatically react to it. So I have music to wake up to in the morning, which is kind of poppy and kind of embarrassing, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I find when I'm working um, industrial, trance, goa, um, really concentrates my mind and actually makes the day kind of go better. Um, when I'm working out, I actually find that the right music will actually cut out pain signals. It'll get me moving. Um, just a note, because I'm going to talk about caring in this talk, and just a note, you need to be a little bit careful because I'm also an insomniac. So I've trained myself not to, um, to able to be able to go to sleep, and so there's eight million little things I have to do. I have to turn the clock away, and blah blah blah, and nothing can happen like at a certain point at the night. Um, but what I've trained myself for is it's the only time of day where I have absolute silence is right before I go to sleep. So I'm out running, and my iPod dies, and uh, I'm sitting there, and it's silent, and I'm like, oh, this isn't so bad, this isn't so bad, and then I realize I'm yawning as I'm running. <laughs> So I've, t I've totally set myself up for this, and I'm like, oh, oh, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. That, that, was, that was a long day. <laughs> so um, music to make art to, I'm actually, that's chick rock and really embarrassing too. Um, but uh, so on to the next slide. Actually, maybe I should tell you this first. Um, I'm going to be going over, some of this will be a little in-depth, I'm going to be going over how the brain works, uh, the brain structures, neurons, which are the basic unit of the brain, neurotransmitters, and um, how music affects the brain, and different things you can do to help tune your brain. So, setting a cue. Um, actually, in preface to this, um, researchers actually had used an MRI to see what was happening in people's brains at the time a decision was made, and this was fairly recent. Uh, and one of the things they found is that uh, your frontal lobe, which is a part where you think your personality is and where you think you make decisions, yeah, that doesn't fire off until after a decision is made. So think about that for just a second, is that you're not really in charge as you think you are. 
because that's happening like way after. What's actually happening when you think you made a decision is you're actually reasoning out why you did something. Um, and at least that's what they think now. <laughs> so, um, so all actions are not really based in your conscious mind. Um, but being that this is the case, it, it's entirely possible to use training as a mechanism to kind of get around this. Because if you can't use your conscious mind and you can't use logic to find your way out of a problem, then you have to find another route. You know, like panic disorders are a completely obvious ex uh, example of this, is panic disorders have zero to do with logic. Uh, you will sit there and worry about, you know, uh, the road going up into the sky and never coming back, and you know it's completely ridiculous, and um, but you'll panic over it anyway. Um, so just a show of hands, how many of you are programmers? Oh yeah, <laughs> quite a few. Um, so how many of you have been stuck, um, no, I don't need to go there yet. How many of you have been stuck in sort of kind of black hole where you sit there for like two hours and you realize, hey, I'm, you know, four hours later you come back to it and it's like, oh, I'm missing a semicolon. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not alone in that. <laughs> so just me. So um, some of the things you can do to get out of that are some of it's queuing and some of it is actually what's called an interrupt is you take a break. You know how you'll walk away, you'll take a break and magically, oh my god, I'm a genius. And uh, you come back and you feel like God until it happens again. <laughs> oh, really? It's not me. Maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> so um, kind of what's happening is, and they don't truly understand this, but kind of the back cycles of your brain is doing stuff um, for you. Uh, one of the like, primary examples of this is catching a baseball. You know, when a baseball is thrown, there's a huge amount of math involved, right? You have the angle, you have the parabola that you have to calculate, plus you have force and mass and wind speed, but your body does that in a split second and catches it. So that's kind of what's happening, um, even though you don't consciously realize it. Um, so because I've been using music to cue, oh, I skip stuff. Anyway, basically, um, it's possible to trick your brain into doing that for you. Um, and I've actually been using music, but um, how that works is it entrains your brain directly because um, you can't really do it from the conscious level. We know that. It's not going to really work. So you have to use tricks to train yourself. Um, some of it's purely setting a cueing mechanism. I know, you know, when I hear certain music, like it's time to do this. Uh, but some of the music, particularly trance and go or any high beat per minute music, uh, is actually going to change uh, your brain waves. It's actually going to calm your brain down into a more relaxed state so that you can concentrate better. Um, so a little bit more on cueing. Um, a while back, um, a friend of mine gave me a book called Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. It's really fantastic. It's actually about how to click train animals. Um, but what she talks about there is how she actually trained her mother into being nice to her. And, <laughs> and she had actually uh, even click trained her students. Um, so it is entirely possible you know, to, to do this. And you can't logic out of it. If you've been trained to do something, it's going to happen. Um, but, uh, and I can't say this enough, it's not your conscious brain that does all of the reasoning. It can do some of it, and it can make changes, and you can train yourself. Uh, but you're not as in charge as you think you are. You're, you're more of a committee of, you know, the entirety of your body than you are just the little part that you think you are. Um, and one of the things that happens and how uh, cueing mechanisms work is that when neurons, which are the basic cells of the brain, uh, when they fire simultaneously enough times, uh, they will always fire simultaneously. It actually creates um, a somewhat physical map in the brain um, that uh, basically is it's kind of indelible. And it turns out that uh, variable training actually is more uh, embeds it uh, much more strongly. Um, and what that means is is you have by when you set um, a cue, uh, is you set a sound or a visual cue or whatever, at the exact same time an action happens. And if you do it over and over again, it happens. 
Um, it's also kind of how language is learned. Uh, like when you see a bird and like your mom or your dad goes, oh, look, that's a bird. You see it and you hear it and you see it and you hear it enough times and it sticks and it creates an actual physical trace in your brain, which is a mapping. Um, this is also how uh, NLP works. And uh, for those of you who pick up chicks with this, you know what I'm talking about. It's <laughs> neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, oops, sorry. Anthony Robbins actually, Anthony Robbins? I don't know. He actually talks about neurolinguistic programming, and there's some kind of creepy guy who is like, oh, this is a great way to pick up girls. And, uh, but it works. That's, it totally works. Um, so, and for me, it's where music comes in. And so, how many of you listen to music? How many of you listen to electronica when you could? Okay. Anything specific? Trance? Side trance. Side trance. Side trance. Goa? Goa. Industrial? Yeah. Eh. Yeah. So, so I've, actually, I've actually queued myself up to uh, deform, which is industrial, and uh, totally stuck on it. Now I can't get rid of it. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to brain basics. Um, and you kind of need to know this so that you can understand what's actually happening underneath and some of the uh, t some of the ways that you can tune your brain actually require you know a little bit of this information. Um, you can fall asleep for a little bit of this, but I'll wake you up when you need it. Um, so the neuron is the basic cell in your brain. It's made of three parts. Uh, there's the dendrite on one end, and that actually receives information. Uh, then there's the cell body, which is kind of what keeps it alive. It's got all the nucleus and the basic stuff to keep it going. Um, and then there's the axon, um, which is actually a tra it actually transmits. It's kind of like a wire, essentially. And then you've got the axon terminal, which actually transmits to the next neuron over. So they kind of link up in a chain, right? Only there's... 100 billion of them, um, unless you've been drinking too much so far this year. Um, <laughs> I may have a few less. Uh, could be, could be. So um, those are the basics of that. And we have to go, uh, I'll get to that. So we're going to go into neurotransmitters, which were first discovered by Otto Lowy. I don't know who he is. Sorry. Um, <laughs> neurotransmitters. This sounds really gobbledygook. They're released from the presynaptic terminal and crosses the receptor membrane of the dendrite. Um, what that is is in the preceding neuron, it's actually going to fire off these little chemicals, which are charged ions. And it's going to fire them into the space between the two cells, which is between the membrane of the dendrite of the next one and the axon terminal of the previous one. And there's actually a space there called the presynaptic gap. And those chemicals are actually going to go in there, and they're charged. Um, but the membrane is also charged, and depending on the state of the neurotransmitter that goes in, and depending on the state of the membrane, it either becomes hyperpolarized, and uh, sorry, I know this is a little difficult, but there will be a quiz later. Um, so <laughs> it's hyperpolarized. So if you actually change the polarization on the membrane, uh, it's an increased likelihood of firing onto the next one, um, which is actually going to create a current. Uh, if you actually um, uh, hy uh, sorry, hyperpolar hyperpolarize it, then what's going to happen, it's kind of going to get stuck, and that's kind of the end of the line, really. Um, so next, um, major brain structures. All right, so you've got your frontal lobe, which is where you think your personality is. Well, kind of is. This is your consciousness. It includes motor function, uh, problem solving, spontaneity, memory, lang memory, language, initiation, judgment, impulse control. Um, and then there's also the parietal lobe, which is kind of up here. Um, and that's pretty much the location for visual attention. It's when you're paying attention to things, when you're looking at something and noticing it. Um, and it's the location for touch perception also, like what's going on when you touch stuff. Um, and it's also for manipulation of objects. It's so you're seeing it, seeing something and looking at something, you know, like you're solving the Rubik's Cube, right? Um, and then there's the occipital lobe, which is in the back. And that's pretty much for vision, because vision is really huge for us. 
Uh, it's actually why uh, blind people actually have greater senses of touch and smell because um, the brain will actually remap itself if it's not using a part, and it'll, they'll just use that whole area there, and it's huge. Um, the temporal lobe, which is like kind of in here, that's actually for hearing, memory, and speech. Um, it's also for the categoriz categorization of objects. <laughs> um, so we can move on. Uh, this is actually the quiz part. Brain waves. Brain waves are actually recordings of the currents that are going on inside your head um, when you're moving from uh, from the dendrite along the axon. Those actually create currents. And the brain waves are actually rec records from an EEG, which is a it's a machine, but there's an electrode that actually sits on top of your scalp and actually reads the uh, currents. Um, Brainwave frequencies are separated into four basic states. Um, there is beta, which is fully awake, which is 14 to 40 cycles per second. Uh, that's pretty much where you're at now. Well, some of you, some of you might be asleep. <laughs> um, um, alpha is relaxed. Uh, it's when you're just kind of maybe watching TV. Um, theta is deeply relaxed. This is probably where you're at, like before you fall asleep at night. Um, delta is dreamless unconscious. That's actually when you're asleep, but before REM, um, or if you're passed out drunk somewhere. <laughs> so why are we trying to get to alpha and theta? Um, and this is actually kind of what you're doing with the music, and it's what it's what you're aiming for. Um, alpha and theta are kind of lower on the the frequency scale. Um, but when you're in beta, which is wide awake, you're thinking about everything around you. And this has kind of an evolutionary purpose. So like our ancestors didn't get like eaten on the savanna. So you're thinking about your grocery list. You're thinking about the guy behind you coughing. You're thinking about everything else. And you're not necessarily paying 100% attention to what you're doing. Um, and the reason why you need to relax is so that you are, you're actually cutting out some of that. You're cutting out the extra things that are going on. So you actually get a little bit more brain power out of that because you're using more of your brain for what you're working on. Um, they actually, it's funny, they did studies in the 70s and 80s that showed that during moments of deep thoughts or creativity, brain waves would actually slow down to alpha and as far as theta. Um, so they know that this happens. and. They don't, they don't always understand why, but it does. So um, this is actually things that you can do to actually kind of increase this whole thing that you're getting from the music. Um, and it's things that other people have done. One of them is actually binaural beats. And what that is, is when a sound of a particular frequency is presented in one ear, and a sound of the particular frequency that's slightly lower or higher is presented in the other ear, the middle of your brain is actually going to make the free, make a new frequency, which is actually the difference of the two. Now, the importance of this is it'll actually entrain your brain waves to that middle frequency. So you can actually pick what frequency you want your brain to go to and by listening to these binaural beats. Um, by brainwave entraining, that's really frequency following response. You know, when you have the two tuning forks or wine glasses, it's kind of the same idea. Um, but, uh, sorry, just a sec. So sorry. Um, there's actually a lot of stuff online. You can actually go to YouTube, and you can find um, music and videos on there that actually have binaural beats embedded. Um, there's actually software you can also buy that will embed uh, binaural beats in whatever music you're listening to. Um, I personally don't use them because I find them kind of annoying, <laughs> but um, they also do require the use of headphones because you have to have either ear. There is some suggestion, though, that binaural beats are actually fuzzy because they're created inside your brain and not necessarily coming from a direct signal in your ear. Um, and so they may not be as good as any strong beats. So what you're listening to now may uh, it may be made better with adding binaural beats to it, or it may not. So it's something you kind of have to find out for yourself through experimentation. Um, so let's move on to the next. So how does this relate to electronic and trance? Um, high beat per minute music is approximately 100, 130 to 160 
beats per minute, um, it can still entrain the brain waves because there's still that frequency following response there. Um, and it roughly, roughly translates to alpha and theta. In fact, it's actually a little bit slower. Um, and it doesn't require headphones. Um, trance is actually pretty aptly named. Um, modern trance actually originated in Germany in the 80s or 90s, and then go inside trance for um, Israel and India, so they're a little bit old, older. But um, it's actually arguable that modern trance is actually more of an offshoot of you know some more like shamanic type music or tribal drumming. I mean, it's really just the, the modern version of that. And so there's kind of a long history of that. There's the dream machine, which is actually the visual version of it, uh, staring into a candle. Any sort of pattern-related item is going to do the same thing. Uh, but what you really want is something that's going to help you while you're having your day and going around your day. And headphones are the most wonderful invention ever. iPods are fantastic. So you can wander around your whole day. You don't actually have to sit in front of a dream machine. Um, so, And another reason, and this is going to be a little bit more boring, sorry. Um, this is another reason why I think the headphones actually really are amazing, is there's what's called stochastic resonance, and it's a long explanation, when noise is added to a system and increased performance is exhibited. What that really means is that there's a little bit of noise going on in your brain, like there's what you're doing and what you're thinking about, and then there's kind of extraneous stuff, kind of like there is in every other system. and. What happens when you add noise to a system, and there's a lot of very complicated uh, explanations that include words like sinusoidal, um, and uh, what happens is it actually cancels out some of the noise so that the line strength is actually much, much better. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is, one, they've actually found that, um, uh, that neurons are actually directly affected by stochastic resonance, stochastic resonance. Um, and the other is there's actually been experiments in the medical field where they've had people who've had problems with balance, and so they've put in um, cochlear implants, you know, implants in the ear, that uh, stimulate the inner ear. And what they've found is with these little vibrating implants is that people actually, their balance would improve. They've also found uh, people with um, heart variability problems, and they've done the same thing, only they've actually used little galvanic electrodes in there to kind of vibrate, and it's actually helped them. Now, this is a little bit less than scientific, but this is kind of my hypothesis, and it's something I really want to test uh, next year when um, my EEG isn't going to electrocute anybody, um, is if it's just, if the vibration in the ear actually does this, are the headphones actually increasing um, the throughput that you're getting while you're listening to them. So even if it was static, which is something I need to test, but I really think that maybe that, um, that vibration in your ear, since they've already done studies on it, I think it probably also works. And that's kind of the next thing I'm working on. Um, so, so now we're kind of on to the EEG. Oh, this is finding optimal music. Actually, if you have an EEG, this is actually kind of a good way to go, is you can kind of listen to music and watch your brain waves as you're, as you're doing it. Um, I did that. This is kind of what an EEG uh, visual representation looks like. Um, so you can kind of see it's got all the, um, it's got all of the, uh, I forget what they're called, all the lines there telling you where you're at. Um, <clears throat> But you can actually build your own from OpenEEG at uh, SourceForge.net actually has um, online schematics. And um, they have all the schematics, all the digital boards. They actually have a bill of materials. They kind of have everything you need to put together one of your own. Um, unfortunately, I do want to say that if you, if you don't really have a huge amount of experience in soldering boards or any sort of EE experience, the last EE experience I really had, I was like 10 years old. My dad had me soldering boards because, you know, we were free labor. And, um, <laughs> yeah, works out great. So um, I kind of jumped in blindly and wildly. And it turns out that ordering parts is a lot of work. Um, and you have to spend a lot of money on tools. 
Uh, one of the things is Olamex actually carries these boards, and it takes a couple of weeks, but they carry the boards fully built, so there's a lot less that you have to do. And the boards, honestly, fully built, are going to cost you less than the tools. So if this is something you want to do all the time, great, build yourself a lab and have at it. It'll be really fun. Uh, but if you really just want the EEG, you're better off buying the boards. And it's still going to be a lot of work. You still have to make the programming cable um, and attach the leads, and there's quite a bit you still have to do. Um, but uh, if you're going to do that, one of the things, uh, Britt Pettis and Joe Grand actually have a great, to, great how to solder video podcast on make.com, and it's actually really, really helpful um, to make sure that you're not uh, making a lot of cold joins, and if you're if you're not actually testing uh, the board as you go, you'll have no idea where they are. Trust me, you'll have no idea where they are later. So this is actually an image of the boards that I stole from OpenEG. Thanks. Um, but there's actually quite a few parts. There's there's something like 200 odd parts on there. This isn't actually even all the parts on. Um, so it's it's quite a project. It's more of a three month project than a three week project. Well, if you're me and have no idea what you're doing. Um, let's see. So the last thing that I do want to go over is um, electrode placement. So if you're going to do this, it's if you don't place them correctly, it's garbage in, garbage out. You know, you could drop them on your head, but you know you're getting a bunch of static or a bunch of stuff that's not working. Particularly if you're using differential electrodes, which is what uh, Open EEG actually is. Um, so it's really important. Um, so basically, what you want to do, and this actually is a picture coming from the top of the head, so it's looking down. Um, and there's a lot more on there than you're probably ever going to want, unless you buy the electro cap, which saves you from all of this. You just drop it on your head. Um, so when you're actually doing the 1020 system, you're actually going to measure from the nason, which is actually right around the bridge of the nose. And you're going to measure from there all the way back to the occipital bone, which is not the occipital bone, sorry, it's the inion, which is actually the bump right on top of the occipital uh, area of the brain. And you measure from there to there, and then you're going to measure above your jaw, like you drop your jaw, that little gap, that little gap right there, you're going to measure from there all the way to there. Now, all of those placements are going to be at 10 and 20 percent. Some of them will be on your forehead, and they'll move 10 to 20 percent as they go. Um, this little slide is actually really nice. This um, this graphic because it's actually got everything pointed out as to which lobe you're looking at. Um, you don't actually have to do all of them. You can actually pick a lobe. If there's something you're interested in, if you want to do some neurofeedback, um, then maybe you want to actually concentrate on the area of the brain that actually works with what you're working with. Um, and this kind of will help you to do that. It's really kind of important to um, check out the right area of the brain. And, you know, you don't want garbage, so it'll make it a lot easier. But that is actually kind of the end of my talk, and mostly summation. You know, the music you're listening to that's working for you, you're right. It is. And um, good to go. Yay. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah. Is there any music that brings you to a beta state? I'm sorry? Uh, the holy awake state? Um, I would actually suggest maybe pop. I mean, I'm just making a suggestion. What you're really looking at is you want to look at the beats per minute, and you want to translate those to cycles to, to per second is what you're looking for. So you want something that's, um, well, maybe that doesn't really work, because that's, that would actually be faster than high beat per minute music. I don't know that you really want to be in beta, be wide awake. Actually, what I use is um, I use poppy music because music will actually also affect your heart rate. And so what you want is something to actually increase your heart rate, and that works kind of differently. And to be honest, I don't actually fully understand how the heart rate uh, part works with your brain yet. Anyone else? Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm actually thinking earbuds, but the full canisters may actually, I, I could see where they would also work, because it's just pounding noise directly into your inner ear. Yes? Oh, 
That's a really good question. And I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm going to actually guess that it has something to do more with our evolution rather than, um, <clears throat> rather than something that was specific. I think it's kind of more of an accidental thing because noise is actually so important uh, for like animals. It's very important. Most animals have way better hearing than we do. Uh, so they can survive in the wild, <laughs> so not get eaten. That's a good point. Yes? Not my research, I don't know. Actually, I haven't actually gotten into the, into the why as far as that. I actually am pretty interested in uh, evolutionary psychology, and I think that would be you know, a really interesting vein to kind of go in and check out. Um, yes? I don't think silence would do the same, no. I can see where direct silence would actually change your brain waves, but I don't see how it would do it through stochastic resonance. Stochastic resonance actually requires that noise be introduced specifically. Or it may, I mean, I suppose it may sound like silence, and it might be, you know, some sort of vibration that you can't hear. I could see that. But actual dead silence is, um, there's no noise. There's no frequency. So it, it wouldn't be through stochastic resonance, but yes, it could also work. Yes? Oh, <laughs> neuro-linguistic neuro programming is actually, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, some guy wrote a book on picking up chicks with it, but neuro-linguistic programming talks about, talks about interrupts that I talked about at the beginning, um, but it also talks about um, how to set cues with other people is really what it is. I've set these cues with music on myself, but it's actually completely possible, like, the, the don't shoot the dog chick with training her mom not to be mean to her, same exact thing. Only um, some guy actually put it together and figured out how to use it uh, to pick up girls. And he actually used um, variable response, which means sometimes you get a reward and sometimes you don't get a reward. And that embeds way deeper. There are books on it if you want. Um, anyone else? Uh, I actually, I actually just divided. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, that's actually math that I don't know and didn't go into. Um, I think any volume that is lower than uh, what would actually hurt your ear is is probably good. I think too low, it's not going to be enough because it's not actually going to get there. I think you actually have to find a mid range of volume. Um, I think too low, it's not going to actually entrain your brainwaves because you're just not, it's, the signal's not actually going to even pass through the auditory nerve as strong enough as you need. Um, anyone else? Okay, I think we're done. Yay. Thank you so much for coming.